Hey, my name is Jesus, and I am the youth pastor here at Charlotte Assembly of God. We are so glad you are jumping on to watch the service from Sunday morning. If this is the first time you've ever tuned into our content, welcome. It is so great to have you with us. For more information about the church, our pastor, and what we believe, go to charlotteag.org or download the CAG app. Each week we gather in person and online to align our hearts in our mission to love God, love people, and live to serve. I hope as you watch this video, you grow closer to Christ and live to love others better. So grab a cup of coffee and your Bible as we dive deep into this week's message. A little introduction. We've been in the book of Romans for a very long time. And we are going through it chapter by chapter. Every chapter could be its own two, three month series in of itself. But I chose to go chapter by chapter to lift the big idea out of that chapter so that we could, we could go through a whole book of the Bible. As I've done this, it's really forced me to preach on topics I don't know if I would have chosen. Not because they're topics I don't want to preach. They're just topics that don't come to my heart as fast as Paul does in Romans. They're not top of mind is what I'm trying to say. And going through the book of Romans is interesting because what I'm doing is basically just telling you what's there. I'm adding a few thoughts. I'm adding a few stories. And the truth is it's very much my words are right from the scripture. And so if you don't like what I say today, then you have a really big problem with the Lord. It has nothing to do with me. But I'm excited to say what I'm going to say today because I really do believe if you will hold on to these truths, if you will make them a part of your daily life, even though it may be a lot of work, you will see incredible transformation take place in you and your family. How many would agree God is wanting to constantly transform us? He's wanting us to look like... you. You can't start the clock because I didn't start yet. Does that, this is what just started over. Just go back. And so this truth, <clears throat> I'll tell you one. This truth is something that we absolutely can embody and we can use it in our life even though it's hard. And so Romans, let me give God praise for that. <clears throat> That wasn't a very good give God praise. Give God praise for that. It is something that we, we all struggle with. So don't think in your mind when I get started here that it would be good for your spouse that did not come or for your neighbor that's in the woods. Uh, don't think that. I want you to think it's exactly for you. And it certainly is something I want to grab hold of. And so Romans chapter 14 if you would stand up when you arrive there, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 4. And when you get there, say yeah. yeah. You ready? Accept other believers who are weak in faith. And don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. For instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything, but another believer with a sensitive conscience will eat only vegetables. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do. For God has accepted them. Who are you to condemn someone else's servant? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall, and with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. Can I read that again? Because there's a lot there. Accept other believers who are weak in faith. And don't argue with them but about what they think is right or wrong. So don't argue. For instance, one anybody ever find yourself in an argument? A little Facebook battle? For, for instance, one person believes that all right to eat anything, but another believer with sensitive conscience will eat only vegetables. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't, 
and those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do, for God has accepted them. Who are you to condemn someone else's servants? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall, and with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. Holy Spirit, I just confess once again that I'm 100% dependent upon you. There's nothing I can do in my own accord, but I'm leaning into you and I'm trusting you. Lord, give us eyes to see, ears to hear all that you have for us and a heart that would perceive this message. Lord, be with us. And all God's people said, yeah. go ahead and, and have a seat. A very famous story that I can share with you. You all know this story, but I'm going to say it again. I probably speak to it many times throughout the year. And the reason for that is it is my favorite story in all of Scripture. He's okay. Leave him. That's fine. It would be a garn, but that's okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. She let go. He's a girl. I, I can't see. There's a story that we have recorded in the Gospels, and it is about Jesus and a woman that is caught in adultery. This woman is dragged out into the street, thrown down into the dust in front of Jesus, and the Pharisees and the teachers, the Christians, the church people, throw her down at the feet of Jesus and communicate very loudly, this woman is a sinner and you need to condemn her because we have caught her in the very act of sin. And they are thinking in that moment that they are gonna see a judgment call upon her and that she is gonna be condemned for that sin. It's interesting to me because they bring her and throw her down because she's caught in the act, but where is the... Exactly. We don't know. We don't know. I don't know. You don't know. Nobody's telling. And so she's thrown down and she's thrown down for judgment and condemnation. There is something that has been done in the dark and now it is exposed to the light. But what they don't realize, these judgmental Christians, is that they are not just throwing her out into the light to expose her, but they are throwing her down at the feet of the light, the light of the world, the one who lights up all of our darkness, the one who lights up every situation in our heart. He is the light. He is the one that shows us the way, right? Give God praise for that. And because they throw her down at the light, obviously this, this sin is exposed, it's called out. And, and there's this amazing moment that we see where Jesus looks up and he says, okay, all right. She's definitely, she's definitely a sinner. She's messed up. Perhaps she lived the life of doing this. And Jesus looks up and he says, but, everybody say, but. but. Turn to your name and say, but. Turn to your other name and say, but. Now it's starting to sound not good, so don't do it. <laughs> Too enthusiastic. But you that has no sin, you've never messed up, you, you, you've never had a misstep. You're perfect. You have it all together. You're short, handsome, and pasty white. <laughs> Go ahead. You throw the first stone. And what we hear is not the sound of judgment. We hear the sound of stones hitting the ground one by one. Can you hear that with me? One after another stone is dropped and it rolls on the dust. I would imagine dust would be kicked up. And it says from the oldest to the youngest left. And what we read is that at the end of all the stones of judgment being dropped upon the ground, there is just Jesus and this woman who was caught in sin. And Jesus looks at her and he says, where are your accusers? And she's like, uh, they're gone. And he says, neither do I condemn you. And this is huge. He says, go and sin no more. Do you think that she never committed sin again in her life? 
Do you think from that moment on, she just had it all together and she checked every box, she crossed every T and she dotted every I and she was the perfect example of what a Christian is? What I would imagine from that story is that she turned and repented from that particular lifestyle. That she no longer went back to that. That's what we know. But she would have had to continue in a path of what we would call sanctification, where we are becoming, leave her alone, look at me. It's one of my favorite people, just got taken out of here. I'd let let her, let her cry. I gotta start over, over here, where are we? Okay, it's called sanctification, where we are becoming more and more like Jesus. And the idea with sanctification is that we are in a process where we look more and more like him. The problem that Paul is addressing here is there are believers who are judging one another for where they are in the process. And something the church is very, very famous for is judging people. And oftentimes we're referred to as hypocrites because we don't have it all together. And yet what we do is we judge those around us who don't have it all together. Pastor Mark used to say this, it's so true. There is no one harder on a smoker than an ex-smoker. And when we read the scriptures, they are very black and white most of the time. But actually, not all the time. And the best way I can communicate this to you is with your hands. Hold your hands up there. Open them up. There are closed-fisted issues. Make a fist. There are things we hold on to and we do not let go. We hold them very tightly. Jesus crucified, Jesus raised from the dead, repentance, walking in righteousness, scripture and prayer, worship. These are things we we hold very, very tightly. But there is, okay, now the other one's still open, right? There, There is a myriad of things in our Christian faith and even in the scriptures that we hold loosely. And what Paul is communicating to the Romans in Romans chapter 14 is not the closed-fisted, you put your hands down, why? No, no, you did, put them back up. What Paul is referring to, and I want this to really sink down into your heart, is that he is talking about the open-handed issues. The things that aren't always so clear. Okay, you can put your hands down because that looks weird. Yeah, the things that are, are not quite crystal clear to us. And I find a lot of times, and I do this, I'm not up here pointing the finger because that would be um, not a good idea when I preach a sermon like this. We all do this at times. We can absolutely major on minors. Things that don't deal with sanctification. They don't deal with salvation, what we would call soteriology. They don't deal with uh, what Christ has done for us so much. But But we hold on to them and What we see is because of these open-handed issues, these things that we could call, is it fair, a gray area. Oh, you can't. Darla, will you take this from me? Because it's, no, I asked Darla. I changed my mind. You got your hand all bundled up. Breck says he's all right. Because of these open-handed issues, there is a lot of disunity that has come into the church. And disunity is not new to us. Disunity is something that has been there from Cain and Abel. 
When we look at the Old Testament, there is constant family feuds, civil wars, and problems between God's people over disagreements. When you fast forward to the New Testament, almost every local church that is mentioned in the New Testament is having some type of division over doctrine, Christian lifestyle, and practice. If we look at it, Corinth was divided over human leaders. Do you remember that part? Everybody's like, yeah, of course I do. And so they end up suing each other. That's like Breck suing Darla because she got the water. It's holy water. We look at the story of Galatia and, and what are they doing? They are biting and they are devouring one another. The, the church in Ephesus, they, they had to be reminded of Christian unity and the importance of Christian unity. Uh, the church in Philippi, there's actually two, two, women, two women at odds with each other. Uh, so much so that the church uh, is going through a split. And so disunity over open-handed issues is not new. It is something that has been around for a very, very long time. Psalms 133 once says, How wonderful and pleasant it is for brothers when they live together in harmony. The heart of God, the Spirit of God desires above all else that there is a unity among his family, his people. And when we get stuck on minor issues, open-handed issues, and if we are not careful, there can be disunity that would come in, into the body, and that is not the heart of God for us. Yeah. Romans 14, the backdrop of it is there's Jews and there's Gentiles. There are Jewish believers, and then there are Gentile believers. And the story communicates why it's so important to not judge. Because those Jewish believers are coming from a background of strict legalism. They had a background in, you can do this, you can't do this, this stays really important, make sure you honor it, this is something you cannot eat, this is something that is out of bounds. And those Jewish believers came from a very Pentecostal background. Just kidding. Some of you don't even know what I mean by that. And, and, and they had so much restriction to their faith. And it would be very difficult for a Jewish believer who grew up under the Torah, who grew up under a rabbi, it would be very, very difficult for them just to let go of that. Because they had spent most of their life in a very rigid, strict protocol when it came to approaching God. And then at the same time, in the same building, in the same room, there are Gentile believers, and these Gentile believers have no background with special days and special diets. They were just glad to be saved. They were just excited about what Jesus had done in their heart. And so they're, they're sitting there eating meat, and the Jewish people are like, oh, how dare you? And... It's a really good picture because we do the same thing today. And so these, these believers in Rome, the Jewish believers, the Gentile believers, they were divided over fairly minor things, days and diets. And the one group, this is, this is, take notes, the one group was sure that the other group was not spiritual. <laughs> they were passing judgment on one another. And those problems exist today. And it's usually with gray areas. Everybody say gray areas. Gray areas. It's, it's the gray areas of life. Uh, they're not clearly right or wrong to every believer. And when we look at scripture, there, there are some things we know are wrong because the Bible clearly states it. 
Thou shalt not steal. That's, that's pretty basic. Thou shalt not commit adultery. That, that's incredibly obvious. And there are some activities, and they're right, because the Bible specifically commands them. It, it is good to take a day of the week and be together as the church in the presence of the Lord. That is something we can do with a clear conscience, because the Bible recommends commands. And so today, I believe that there are many issues that we wrestle with as believers And some believers believe one way and think they're spiritual because of what they believe to be true. And then there are other believers who believe differently and they think they're spiritual. There's something about Christians, uh, they always think they're more spiritual than someone else. I guarantee you in 10 years, if you have not walked out of here and you said, I'm more spiritual than Shane, then you're telling a lie. You may not realize you said it, but when you have roast pastor at lunchtime, you're basically communicating it. Not in this church, not first service anyway. Romans 14, 5, in the same way, some think one day is more holy than another day, while others think every day is alike. So some examples of gray areas, and and there's one big one I'm leaving out today. Let me, let me throw this out to you. And, and I'm not here to, to offend anyone or... I, I'm not... I'm not if, gray area is a hat in a building. A ball cap in the building. I'll look at you because you're wearing one. There, there is some believers who say, how dare you wear a hat in the house of God? But where, did, where, where, where exactly does it say that? Can you show me the scripture? I could probably show you a scripture where they cover their head. I don't think you could find one that says you can't wear a hat in the building. At the same time that some can wear a hat in the building because that's what their faith allows them to do, there are other people who can't wear a hat in the building. As soon as they hit the door, they pull the hat off. Let me ask you, is it clear in scripture if or can we wear a hat or not wear a hat? It's not there. You'll never find it. You can look and you can look all you want to, but it doesn't exist. And so if you wear a hat in the building, praise God for that. That's all right. You can definitely, come on, praise God for that. (laughs) Wear the hat. I got a lot of hats. I'm balding, right? And so I would preach in a hat, but there are people who don't think it's a good idea. And so if you think, hey, I'm not wearing a hat in the building, then okay, praise God for that. But that's a great area. It's, it's not a salvation issue. Now, it's another issue I'll address in just a moment. But what about Christian celebrations? I'm, I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna step on toes, but it's, it's a great area. Some people think they can celebrate Christmas and they can put lights and ornaments on the tree. And then there are other Christians who say, how dare or no, we're not supposed to have a Christmas tree in the house. We're not supposed to celebrate Christmas at all. My grandmother did not celebrate Christmas. She believed that it went against God's word. Praise God for her. But it's not really clear in scriptures that we should not or we should. It's it's a gray area for us. Music, that's another one. I personally believe that secular music, for the most part, 99.2% of it is not beneficial. It's not helpful. It doesn't draw us closer to Jesus. But there are people who say it's not a big deal as long as the words are pure and noble and of good report. And so some people are going to roll out of here jamming to something. And then other people are going to roll out of here to, Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above. And, and, and you know what? It's, it's really a gray area. 
What about school? This is one. Some people believe that kids shouldn't be put into public school. And then some people believe that kids should only be in Christian school. And can I tell you, you are both right. You're not wrong. You like it, don't you? And there are so many gray areas. I could just go down the list of the different things that we hold on to, but recognize that some of these things are standards and practices that are simply tradition. They're not scriptural. Darla, I need that water. They're not praising the Lord enough on this one. That was so good. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> my, my wife, I do love you so much. That's just an accent you held on to. My wife grew up in church. She basically was born. She got saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, and just stayed close to Jesus all the days of her life. Like, if there's anybody perfect, it, it, it's definitely my wife. She's, she's got it pretty much all together. She grew up in a household where they could watch movies. Right? They could watch movies, but they couldn't watch movies on Sunday. In fact, they couldn't go to a movie theater to watch movies on a Sunday. But they could go home and watch a movie at the house. It makes no sense. But there is a tradition there, not a scriptural precedence there. There was, I, okay, I'll, I'll just sell my, that clock is broke, I can see. I, I just know that, that as a youth pastor, many, many years ago, I don't want to get too too far away from here. Many years ago, I, I was a youth pastor and uh, I was doing fifth quarters. You know what a fifth quarter is? It's, it's a, basically an activity after the football game. You have uh, devotions, but you have just a lot of fun. And so I had a really big desk and this kid comes in and he teaches me how to play Texas Hold'em. And so we begin every fifth quarter to play poker with pennies and nickels and dimes, nothing crazy. Nobody's, you know, losing the family farm. And so I, I thought, isn't this wonderful? I'm bonding with these guys. They're coming every Friday night. I'm sharing Jesus with them and we're playing poker. My heart was good. It was pure. And my pastor found out that we were playing poker every Friday night. And this, I kid you not, this is verbatim. I can't believe you're playing poker. Sister Keller would roll over in her grave. Why well, didn't you know Sister Keller? I don't even know where she was buried, to be honest with you. I couldn't even go and apologize. But to a generation, and, and that generation is still very present, so I want to be honoring. I really want to be honoring, and, and I'll be real honoring as I close. To a generation, to play cards was sinful, and to another, to play cards is not. To one, wearing a hat in the building is inappropriate, and to another, it's not a real big deal. And so it's okay to have those strong beliefs, but we have to recognize them for what they are, and that is tradition, not Scripture. I, I think you get the point. What about translations in the Bible? This, this is a whole can of worms I won't crack open today. Mark 7, 7 through 9, their worship is a farce. For they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. For you ignore God's law and substitute your own tradition. You skillfully sidestep God's law in order to hold on to your own tradition. When we put tradition over the word of God, that is where legalism creeps into the church. And when legalism creeps, in, creeps, creeps in the church, when legalism creeps into the church, that is where judgment comes from. That is where casting stones start. And you know what follows that? Every time, disunity. That's why there's so many different types of churches. and different, I don't know how many Pentecostal churches. There's tons of them. There are so many different faith traditions. There's, there's Orthodoxy and there's Roman Catholic and, and there's Protestants. And then underneath that, there's, there's, there's a lot. There's just a lot of them. And, and why is that? Because there was a disagreement over some type of 
passage of scripture that led to traditions more than they led to the word of God. I feel like I'm drilling home a point that you already know to be true. Paul explains to the believers in Rome how they can get along when it comes to these non-essential things. And you may say, oh, you just ticked me off, little guy, because those are essential to me. Well, again, I'll ask you, if it's in Scripture very clear, then yes, it's an essential. If it is not clearly stated in the Scriptures, then it is a non-essential. And I would even add to this that if you're twisting the Scripture to make it line up with your idea, then it's a non-essential. But if you can... Look, I didn't, I, didn't choose to, I, didn't choose, I didn't choose this. This is chosen for me by the Lord. It's so good I could come down on the floor. If it's clear, you don't have to twist it and, and pull it and do spiritual gymnastics to make it say something. Then it's an essential. And what Paul communicates is there's non-essentials that will cause this unity and those things are going to be there. They're going to be a part of your journey with Christ. It's what we do with those things that makes all the difference. <laughs> do you see what I see? Right now, just all, all across, those of you at home, those of you in the room, <laughs> what are some non-essentials? Don't say them out loud. Maybe you are, you are rescued and saved from those non-essentials. Can I tell you that it is, well, I don't want to tell you that before I have to tell you that. So how do we handle these differences? Because I can promise you, I can guarantee you, I assure you, I will never play poker again the rest of my life. I actually don't think it's that big of a deal. But there is a, a generation that I love and I serve and I want to lay my life down for and I recognize that for them it is a no-go and so therefore I want to honor that. I want to honor that. And so it's important that we recognize poker may not be communicated clearly in the scriptures, but it is very clearly articulated to people's hearts. And therefore, you'll never catch me in a poker match. I'm not any good anyway. And so if you're taking notes, let me give you five things that we can employ to grasp the unity that we need, even when there's things we don't agree on. Some things we just agree to disagree. <clears throat> Romans 14, three says, those who feel free to eat anything must not, I'm sorry, it should, yeah, 14, three. Uh, those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do, for God has accepted them. We're not supposed to look down on people who don't and we're not supposed to condemn people who do. I don't know if it can get any more clear than that. Is that pretty straightforward to you? Some of this is, you just don't like this. And some of you are like, yeah, preach it, brother. Can you put that back up? Don't look down and don't condemn. Romans 15, 7 Therefore, accept each other just as Christ, it should say 14, but I messed up, as Christ has accepted you so that God will be given the glory. So write this down. We should not reject those who God has already received. God has received us. And that's what you would say if you could have the microphone. You can't have this one, but you can have Jesus's. Uh, I 
we, we would agree that we're saved and set free and that God, God has received us unto his own. And yet, when we live in a place where we put non-essentials over essentials or we put open-handed issues over closed-fisted issues, uh, we're not really receiving a brother or a sister in Christ. And so what Paul says very clearly is we're not supposed to argue about those things. Do you know how many YouTube pages and Facebook pages would be shut down in a heartbeat if they really listened to the word of God? Do you know how many Bible studies would cease to exist if they really took this to heart? That as believers in Jesus Christ that have been accepted by Jesus uh, understood we are not supposed to argue about these things. When I was in Bible college, me and my roommates would gather and all we did was argue. It was completely unscriptural. And it says this, we are not to judge or despise one another. And when we allow gray areas to become black and white issues, it creates division and it separates us from each other. And what Paul says is, no, there must be a unity and you need to accept one another as Christ has accepted you. The second thing, if you're taking notes, and this is, this is huge, and you would think, well, this is very straightforward. And uh, I don't think it is, because if it's that straightforward, we would be doing a lot better. It says, we are not to judge each other. Romans 14, 10 through 12, so why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For the scriptures say, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me and every tongue will declare allegiance to God. Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. So let's stop condemning each other. You don't wear the robe and the gavel. Well, you don't wear a gavel, you, you slam a gavel. You hold a gavel. You shouldn't have a robe and a gavel because the only judge is Jesus. He's the judge. And he's the one that will judge us according to our own works. We are supposed to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. We're not supposed to work out somebody else's salvation. And we'd have a lot more unity in families and in the body of Christ if we would just hold to this truth that we are not going to judge other people at all. And so when we pass judgment on each other, we are absolutely going against the Scripture. So if you want to talk about going against Scripture, it's passing judgment on each other. Look, when I first got saved, I've said this before, but I'll say it for the new people, and there's a lot of you, I thought I was the only one going to heaven. I was convinced everybody was going to hell, that nobody was as spiritual as I was, nobody prayed as much as I did, and nobody worshiped as loud as I did. And I felt really good about that. And it's sad to me that the church, the body of Christ, has a reputation for being judgmental. You would agree we have that reputation. We devour each other. Number three, Christians must not force their opinions on others. I'm not even going to give a balancing statement to that. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not even going to do it because it'll just, it'll just, I'm not going to. Where do you get that? Well, let me tell you. Romans 14, 22. You may believe that there's nothing wrong with what you are doing, but keep it between yourself and God. <laughs> don't, you love, don't you love God's word? Because it's so clear. <laughs> Blessed are those who don't feel guilty for doing something they have decided is right. 
Now, there's, there's limits to this. I will give this bouncing statement. We're talking about open-handed issues, not closed-fisted issues. Holiness matters. Righteousness matters. Being obedient to the Lord. Is it? Yes. But diets and days and hobbies and there's a lot of open-handed things. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about this. Say we're not talking about this. Say we're talking about this. And so if we have a sincere conviction about something that is a open-handed issue, we are supposed to keep that between us and, and God. And I, I have a lot of convictions that I'm not going to bring to the pulpit necessarily because they're just not for everybody. I, I will, I'll give you one, and, and I don't... I, it's a long story, but until about a year and a half ago, I never listened to any secular music whatsoever because it was a no-go for me. It was out of bounds. Any and all secular music, except for Christmas music, that, that was okay. But I didn't judge people who rolled up jam into Nirvana. The faith you have, keep it between you and God. If you have faith for something, bless you and bless God. We cannot borrow another person's convictions. <laughs> Some can... And some can't. I will tell you as, as, a, as an elder, that's what pastors were, elders. I'm a very young elder. Just the beginning of my eldership. Forget bishop, call me elder. No, don't do that. That's, that's, just, just call me Shane. Unless you're my mom, then you can say Shane Michael. Where am I going? Start over. There are just things that I can't do. I really can't do them. They may be great, but because I'm supposed to lead the people of God, I'm supposed to set example, then there's just things I absolutely will not do. And, and I just hold those convictions very, very tightly. But there are some that can and th there are some that can't. And I, I've learned this over, over the years that based off of our own Jesus story, the background of our life is where we develop certain convictions. If you grew up, let me get a, a vanilla excuse here. If you grew up and your, your father gambled away the family farm by playing poker and you fell in the same tra trap, guess what, when you got saved, you probably get, you gave up that, that and now it's just a no-go for you. Because that's part of your salvation story. Yes? Amen. Good job, pastor. And I find a lot of times that things we hold to be essential are just based off of our own story. Uh, that, that's true for me. I, I gave up secular music. God spoke to me. It was very, very clear. I burned all those CDs. CDs are this little round disc, and you put them in, you suck them, and they spin around and around. And the best part was opening it up and seeing what was on the cover of the CD. Remember that? It had all kinds of... We're sideways. And so for you, you may come out of a very legalistic background and you hold on to some of those roles. And, and I would say that's okay. And I'm going to tell you why here in a second, but, but that's all right. You may come from a, a background of unchurched life like I did. And there are just certain things I just don't understand. I don't understand them. And yet, I want to be honorable to everyone. And then here's, here's number four, and this is the most important thing, because Paul says, do not cause others to stumble. 
Romans 14, 12 through 13, yes, each of us will give a personal account to God, so let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. Romans 14, 20 through 21, don't tear apart the work of God over what you eat. Remember, all foods are acceptable, but it is wrong to eat something if it makes another person stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine, drink wine, drink wine, Drink, drink wine. Did you see that? I said drink wine. Can you read that with me? <laughs> don't drink wine. Or do anything else if it, it says don't drink wine. Or do anything else if it might cause another brother to stumble. We cannot take our Christian liberty to the extreme of causing other people to stumble. I probably could play poker and have no issue, but if there's somebody who just gave it up because they've gambled away everything, I'm causing them a very, very big problem. If, if, if no more examples, okay. Can't do it. No, I'm not gonna say it. Well, maybe. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. <laughs> that was really good. I like that one. It, I mean, I'm having a blast today. It's just so much fun. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. I'm going to say it. You guys feel left out, don't you? Here we go. Hi. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. <laughs> uh, sorry. Because our actions affect other people. You, you are not living out your faith on an island unto yourself. You're not a silo, as they would put it. Your actions, your belief system... The things that you do, they have an impact on other people. If I rolled up in here with a cigar, uh, guess everybody would have a cigar next week, right? Because I recognize that if I, I don't know if that's a good example. I'm just trying to pick vanilla things, Pastor. I'm trying to be very generous. Uh, if, if, and some people are like, I, can I just forget it? Just never mind. <laughs> Our actions impact other people. And, and when we live a life of Christian liberty, we have to understand that we can, but they can't. Therefore, we don't in front of them. And I'm not talking about living a duplicitous lifestyle. Nobody's saying that, right? We're talking about open-handed issues. Not closed-fisted issues. We're talking about non-essentials. Yes, amen, thank you, Shane, and Jesus the most. Romans 14, 15, for if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. And number five, if you're taking notes. Christians, Christians must help each other grow. Romans 14, 19. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Both need to grow. The strong believer, because this, let me reframe it and then we'll close. Um, if um, somebody will come back. It's interesting to me because he refers to strong believers, the ones that can eat whatever the meat, and he refers to the, the Christians that can only eat vegetables as the weak. Think about that for a moment. The Christians in legalism are the weak ones. We would disagree if we had the mic. Well, they're so holy and, and they're living sacrificial and, and they're giving it up for God. Hallelujah. 
But he actually says they're the weak Christians and then the strong Christians are the ones that enjoy Christian liberty within the bounds of what we've just described. Oh, not too much. And so both need to grow. Strong believers need to grow and weak believers need to grow. The strong believers need to grow in love and the weak believers need to grow in knowledge. And it says this, a brother who is new in their faith, we must lovingly deal with them in their immaturity. And if we really love them, we're, we're gonna help them grow. Let, let me give you this example. This is a brilliant example. I didn't come up with it myself, but second service will think I did because at this point I, I came up with it on my own. But that's not true. I'm just using it. When we had little kids in the house, we made sure that we did not leave a hot pot on the stove with the handle sticking out. Talk to, because you guys have a lot of babies over here at the south room. When we had little kids running around, you do. When we, when we were run, had little kids running around the house, uh, we put little, especially our first child, our second child was out of luck. But the first one, the first one, we, we put a bunch of those little uh, plug covers on, right? So they wouldn't stick something, right? The second child is like, go ahead, stick the fork in there, see how that feels. You'll never do it again. Little baby gates and all kinds of child protective measures in our home. You would agree that you didn't need those things. You're not sticking a fork in the plug, I don't think. You don't need a baby gate because you're not gonna fall down the stairs. <laughs> and so when you have a small child in the home, you live a certain way. And then when the child grows older, you, you live a different way. And that beautifully communicates that there are just things I will not do that I can do because I care deeply about that new believer in faith. There are things that I could do, but it doesn't make me more spiritual. And so this is summed up, I don't have it here, but it's there. Whatever we do, do it in faith, because if we don't do it in faith, it is there for sin. So if you're gonna do it, and it's not clear, and it's an open-handed issue, you do it in faith. James says, and James is a legalist, he, he said, whatever is not faith is sin. Paul says the same thing here. If you're gonna do it, if you're gonna go for it, make sure your faith says yes. And this is how I wanna close. You glad you came today? Can we give God praise? I, that was to brag. I don't know what you thought that was, but that was to brag. We gotta stop judging one another. Even Paul, when he corrected a couple of believers, took them to the side and taught them the better way. And so whether you can eat meat or you can't, whether you observe certain days or you don't, we are all part of the same family of God and we are to love one another in such a way that we don't cause another one to stumble. Thanks for watching. If you have a prayer request or more questions about God or the church, go to charlotteag.org.
and hit the connect tab so we can be in contact with you. We hope you have experienced the life-changing love of Jesus Christ through this message. If you are looking to get connected, one easy way is to join us at 7 p.m. on Wednesday nights as we pray. And don't worry, because there is a place for your child or student as well. Have a blessed day, and may Christ's love shine upon you.